Welcome to a uh, very, very warm building on a very, very hot day. I guess uh, you couldn't ask for more on a, on a, a day when we're going to have a talk about the, the future of the planet and the extent to which uh, uh, global warming is with us forever. This might, uh, we might be having talks like this in 20 years uh, when it's this warm inside and outside in December. Who knows? We'll find out that question today. My name's Kevin Gallagher. I'm a faculty member of the Department of International Relations and a faculty fellow here at the Frederick Pardee Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future. And I thank all of you for coming to what is our last Pardee House seminar of the semester. We've had an incredible uh, group of talks over, over the semester and we're excited to culminate with uh, Frank Ackerman's discussion about his new book uh, called Can We Afford the Future? The Economics of a Warming World. Um, even though many of you might go away for the summer, the Pardee House will still be cooking here uh, throughout the summer. We just released uh, information about our Summer Fellows Program. I encourage you all to go look at our webpage and find out about all the interesting fellows that will be working here this summer on a number of uh, interesting issues about the future and, and human development. We're also about to put out a number of interesting publications. We have an Issues in Brief series. Three of them will come out in the next week or so. Uh, snazzy looking. Um, policy briefs. We've got one by Francis Moore LePay coming out called Seeing Hunger Through New Eyes from Lack of, to Possibility, um, a number on the food crises in developing countries, and another one on sustainable development, trade, and climate change in Africa. So uh, keep visiting our webpage when you're looking for things to take to the beach with you over the summer. Um, now let me go on to today's talk. I'm really excited to have uh, Frank Ackerman, someone who I've known for uh, almost 20 years. Uh, to come over here to BU to talk to us about, about his new, new book. There's some good news and bad news about global warming. The good news is, is that the scientific community basically stopped debating it. Uh, for the past 20 years or so, there, or at least since the late 1980s, uh, there was a big debate in the scientific community on the extent to which climate change was happening and perhaps more importantly, what were the human impacts of climate change? Did humans have an independent impact on global climate change? Well, that debate is pretty much over. Thanks to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, there's unanimous uh, agreement among the world scientists and the peer-reviewed literature that humans have an impact on climate change and the climate is expected to warm over time. So that means that you can just since the scientists tell us that it's a problem and that we need to go do something about it, it should be easy as that. Let's put together the right policy, correct? Unfortunately, that's not the case. That's where the bad news comes in. Where there was a raging debate over the past 20 years on the science of climate change, now the debate has moved into the economics community. Where you have some economists saying that doing something comprehensive about climate change could cause financial crises and, and cost so much that it could uh, put our countries into an economic tailspin. And then you have uh, climate pessimists who think uh, and argue through their empirical work that uh, responses to climate change are actually good for the economy and they're uh, part of a significant path that we need to get ourselves to sustainable development in the longer range future. So Frank Ackerman is right on the ground floor of, uh, of this debate. Frank, uh, Frank's new book, Can We Afford the Future? The Economics of a Warming World, is, uh, is a real gem for all of us because this debate, even though it started to rage only maybe over the past five to seven years, has become highly technical, highly mathematical. Um, Frank Ackerman has uh, 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 degrees in mathematics from Swarthmore and a PhD in economics from, uh, from Harvard University. But this book that uh, he'll talk to us about today is the policymaker's guide to understanding this issue. Uh, you'll, it's a very short book, very easy to read. I don't think there are any mathematical equations in, in, the, in the whole thing. Uh, he's read them and made sense of them for us, which, uh, as you'll see, we'll, we'll thank him for. Uh, thank him for that. Um, Frank's going to give a, a presentation based on his book today. It'll be about 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll be able to ask questions for Oh, a little less than a half hour or so, and then he's got some copies of the book that, um, that uh, he can sell to you if, if you want, and if, we, if we're real nice to him, um, maybe he'll, maybe he'll sign, sign them for us if, if he can. So uh, it's a real pleasure to bring Frank here. As I said, I've known him for a long time, and uh, we're trying to get him here. Here's the perfect opportunity. Let's, uh, let's find out if we can afford the future from Frank Ackerman from Tufts University. Okay. 
Thanks. The, uh, the title of the book occurred to me one day thinking about what would it mean to conclude that the fate of the earth is at stake and we can't afford to do something about it. Uh, you know, what else are we saving our money for is a question that occurs to you, but you know, maybe we should have one last party and pull the plug. Uh, I'm, I'm going to explore a different approach to the economics of climate change. Here's what I'm not going to talk about. I, as Kevin said, I think the debate is over about the scientific evidence. The world is getting hotter, sea levels are rising, snow cover is decreasing, the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is more certain, more unanimous, and more scary every time they look at it. Uh, I'm not sure that people have fully assimilated it. People talk about business as usual. If we don't do anything about climate change, we could have five degrees Celsius, nine degrees Fahrenheit, warmer temperatures by the end of the century. If you haven't been thinking about it, that might not sound so bad. Today is much more than five degrees Celsius warmer than yesterday. I uh, live in New England, you experience daily swings like that quite a few times in the year. But as a 24-7, 365 days of the year global average, it's quite serious. Uh, five, the present day temperature minus five degrees is the temperature of the last ice age. Uh, glaciers were south of New York City, almost south of London. Um, the present temperature, plus five degrees, it's now thought hasn't been seen for 30 million years. When it was last seen, the world was covered by swampy forests. There were, of course, no ice caps anywhere, and there were alligators at the North Pole. So um, one extreme is good for polar bears, one's good for alligators. Uh, we're sort of the Goldilocks species. Uh, we, were, we do a lot better if it stays right in between those in the zone in which our species <coughs> evolved and thrived. Um, so looking at this evidence, which is more certainly known, better research and more certainly known than any scientific input into public policy ever has been on anything, the question for me is, what is the basis for inaction? What is the basis for not taking this seriously? Well, th this is the style of inaction which uh, we enjoyed over the last eight years, now happily ended, and I think uh, Cartoon probably does it uh, as much justice as anything. The cartoonist here imagines that global warming was a uh, fire alarm in the uh, Bush administration's uh, firehouse in case of global warming. Make sure everyone in the building agrees there's a fire. Bring in a few outside skeptics and let them talk a long time. Uh, consider there may just be a small fire. Realize that calling the fire department isn't free, you know, and on and on like that. So th that was ridiculous that we were a laughing stock to the world. Uh, we had the good sense to uh, change the people who are running the firehouse here. But this is not the only style of despair, of inaction. They're to, to go to an opposite end of sophistication. Here's a picture which some of you may or may not have seen when it first came out. I call it, what will you wear to the apocalypse? Uh, you know, the picture is <coughs> the oceans are rising over the New York City skyline. What else would you think about besides sex and fashionable clothing, after all? And. Uh, <laughs> This, uh, look closely at the fine print, that was a diesel ad uh, for what diesel called their global warming ready line of clothing that they brought out about two years ago. So, I mean, there, you, can, <laughs> you can despair in the crude style, you can despair in the uh, sophisticated style. Um, what, what are the more formal excuses for inaction? Um, that what, I forgot to turn off my cell phone, it's always important, okay. Um, there's the fake science, uh, the, the handful of extremely well-funded skeptics who defied all the scientific literature, who Fred Singer was one among them, said that temperature extremes are decreasing, hurricanes are uh, diminishing. This was a pre-Katrina uh, remark of his, uh, look the evidence in the face and lie about it. That, that was one style, uh, pretty much defeated now, but th here's a more troubling, serious style. Uh, the mainstream economics, these people are not cranks funded just by a few energy companies. These are some of the best known economists writing about climate change. William Nordhaus, the best known American economist writing about climate change, runs a model uh, and says that the optimal rate of emissions reduction is 25% by mid-century, and he means 25% from his business as usual estimate. He actually thinks the ideal is to allow emissions to arise considerably. The rest of the world is talking about 80% reduction from uh, recent levels as being absolutely necessary to stabilize the climate. The best known economist writing about it thinks we can afford to let it rise. In his model, we can spend 200 years removing carbon emissions from the economy. That would be the optimal path. Um, 
Not to be outdone, Richard Toll, Europe's answer to this, uh, Europe's uh, best known and avidly self-promoted economist who writes about climate change, uh, has been quoted as saying that the optimal tax is $2 a ton of CO2. Uh, that is two cents a gallon on gasoline. Just imagine how much less everyone will drive if the price of gas goes up two cents. Uh, this is not playing with the same deck of cards. This is not part of the same universe of policy analysis and recommendations that everyone other than economists thinks is involved. So the Stern Review came out a few years ago. The British government commissioned Nicola Stern to do a review of the economics of climate change had a tremendously positive effect on the debate. Uh, it recognized the urgency of the problem, and it claimed that conventional economics in Stern's version of it actually supported taking rapid, drastic action. I have described this, the chapter of my book about the Stern Review is called Much Less Wrong. Uh, I don't think it got everything right, but I think it's a big improvement. It's very good on the question of discounting, which we'll come to soon. It's very good on the questions of global equity and negotiation, which I'm not going to talk about, but are important. It makes some progress on risk and uncertainty, and I think it's still stuck in the world of cost-benefit analysis, <coughs> which I'm also going to talk about. So it seemed to me that to avoid the eyes glazing over effect that economists are so familiar with as you start to explain the technical details to people who aren't taking your course for credit, um, maybe even some who are, um, I, it seemed to me that we need to have not something deep in the technicalities, because most of these economists who I disagree with are good at the technicalities. The question is, what are their underlying assumptions that lead to this strangely wrong view, this view that we could you know, treat it as a second order problem where we have to avoid spending too much instead of a crisis. And it, my goal here, and this is the focus of the first half of the book, is to come up with four ideas sufficiently simple and memorable that they could be on bumper stickers to explain what's wrong with the standard economics. What do you need to construct an economics of climate change that makes sense of it, that agrees with the way everyone other than economists talks about climate change? So these are the four, which I'm going to talk about in order. The first one is your grandchildren's lives are important. Most of you don't have grandchildren yet, but you, you will. And uh, their lives are important. Uh, discounting, some of you have uh, run into in classes. Uh, discounting is compound interest in reverse. Leave money in the bank. And uh, over time, it grows rapidly in value uh, at 3% interest leave $100 in the bank for 100 years, you've got $1,900. Leave it there for 200 years, and you've got $37,000. Uh, of course, who the you is that's got it is the question. Uh, present value calculation is the same thing in reverse. What do you have to put into the bank now to have $100, 100 years from now, 200 years from now? And the interest rate that's used in this calculation, the discount rate, uh, is very, very important in calculating this. To have $100 100 years from now, put $5 and change in the bank now. To have $100 200 years from now, put basically a quarter in the bank right now. 200 years of compound interest at 3%, uh, you'll be there. Why, do the, why does this matter? This is the most important single number in the economics of climate change. A high discount rate makes it very hard to see the importance of the future. We have to look at costs relatively soon to achieve benefits much farther out in time. That's the nature of the economic problem of climate change. And how you value things farther out in time compared to things closer in time is all important. So let's imagine that we know that there's exactly $1,000 of damages that will occur 100 or 200 years from now and say, what is it worth in economic terms to prevent that? What is the amount of money you'd have to put in the bank today to have $1,000 100 or 200 years from now to pay back the future victims of that damage. Well, it's extremely dependent on the interest rate. There's the value. There's the amount you have to put in the bank now to have $1,000 100 years from now. At 1.5%, close to the discount rate that Stern used, you can still see it's got about a quarter of its value. It's, you know, 226. At 3%, much which is the low end of standard discount rates that standard models use. Uh, it's down to $53. At 6%, not at all unknown in conventional economics, it's down to $3. Right? The, the bigger the interest rate, the less you put in the bank now to get $1,000, the less it's worth. Run the clock out another 100 years. Uh, 
At one and a half percent, you can still see fifty dollars more or less of the thousand. Uh, at three percent, we're down to three dollars, and at six percent, it's gone. Six percent, two hundred years, you lose five orders of magnitude. A thousand dollars becomes a penny. So two hundred years from now doesn't exist at six percent. The future actually does exist at something like one and a half percent, which is what the Stern review used. Actually, one point four percent. You could stop the talk there, and you'd have a really solid answer to it. Uh, low discount rate, you see the future. High discount rate, you don't. So, well, I always say, I don't think the world is going to look like this in 2100. But if I'm wrong, call me up. I'll buy you a drink. <laughs> right? I mean, the point here is that we are talking about things that none of us will live to see. The nature of the problem here is different from a standard investment problem where you experience costs now and benefits later in your life. This is you today, those of us living today, you, we, are going to spend money so that a we that we will never know, our grandchildren and their grandchildren and so on, will enjoy a livable earth which has more or less the natural services that make it livable for us rather than alligators or polar bears. Um, so the question of how do you choose a discount rate for that? Market interest rates, which are popular for short-term investments, I can make a case that for a short-term private investment, you should use the market interest rate to do this calculation, thinking about a mortgage, a college loan, a car loan, et cetera. There's no reason for long-term intergenerational public policy to work that way. Uh, one aspect of this, probably the least controversial part, is to say if future generations are going to be richer, they'll need less help from us, so we should discount costs that they'll experience, benefits that they'll experience on the basis that they'll be better able to take care of themselves. This idea comes back to bite you if you think that uh, maybe the environmental crisis is bad enough that future generations could be poorer, and in that case they need more help, and we should be essentially having negative discounting value their outcomes at more than ours. That's the simple part. The complicated part is what's called pure time preference. If all generations are equally wealthy, should you discount? If you knew that your children, grandchildren, et cetera, will be exactly as rich or poor as you are, what's the right discount rate to use now? Stephen Schneider, who's one of the leading climate scientists at Stanford, says that this question can be translated as, is your granddaughter worth less than your daughter because she'll be born a generation later? If they're worth the same amount, then pure time preference component of discounting is zero. OK, that was idea number one. Idea number two is to think about insurance. Uh, OK, um, here's another one of these pictures of things that isn't happening. This is not a picture of climate science. This is a picture of a bad movie that came out about five years ago. But it conveys the image of catastrophic events, which is what I want to talk about. Are, are we thinking about worst cases or averages? Economic analysis, a cost-benefit analysis is all about averages. Uh, so let's look at sea level rise, as we sort of saw in that last picture. The most likely outcome is in the order of a meter, maybe a one and a half meters, depending on how you read the evidence, maybe a little less than a meter. To debate sort of the central estimates without a catastrophic event, basically a loss of a big ice sheet. Don't lose a big ice sheet. We're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of one meter. Um, that's really hard on low-lying areas. You could spend real money on seawalls, on protection. Uh, island nations, places, deltas like Bangladesh, uh, Miami, the southern tip of Florida. There's a lot of specific places where that'll be kind of hard on things, but they are specific places. Uh, the imagery, as with the bad movies and so on, not only bad movies, is based on worst cases. What if we lose the Greenland ice sheet? That's seven meters of sea level rise. Doesn't happen all at once. That big an ice cube takes a long time to melt, but there comes a point it's believed where it's irreversible. There's nothing you can do except watch it melt. Uh, that is a catastrophic event. Seven meters, 23 feet of sea level rise no one can actually build protections against. And the, the impact on coastal ecosystems, coastal environments. Um, so, so how serious is sea level rise this century can be translated as will the Greenland ice sheet melt? Uh, complete melting is unlikely. It's not the most likely outcome, according to that whole scientific consensus we're talking about. Um, I don't think it's really advanced science to think that it gets more likely to melt as it gets warmer. Right? 
Ice melts faster when it gets warmer, right? Um, so on average, there's no problem this century. And the worst case w is that there's increasing cause for worry, and it gets less unlikely as it gets warmer. That's a picture. This, this one actually is a picture of the Greenland ice sheet. I don't think it used to have that much flowing water on the surface. Uh, you know, is that just a little blip? Is that the sign of the beginning of the end? OK, so let's talk about why people buy insurance. When you go to the airport, I go to the airport. I can't stand the airport. I could, in fact, go to the airport timing it so that I would, on average, arrive exactly in, on time to walk onto the plane. You know, less time looking at junk food, less time listening to those dreadful security announcements. And on average, I'd catch the plane half the time. Right? That's what the average would mean. Nobody does that. Actually, when there used to be hourly shuttles that you could take, you know, if there's an hourly shuttle, you can do that. If there's a once a day and you may not be able to book a different ticket, you wouldn't possibly risk that. Uh, once you get to the airport, you spend a lot more low quality time on airport security, which is all about worst cases because the average person is clearly no threat to anyone. So insurance is not based on average outcomes. On average, no one ever needs their insurance policy. This is the arithmetic of it. If, if, if a majority of people cashed in on insurance, it wouldn't work. So insurance is a product which, on average, you don't need. So I decided to look up how frequently do people need insurance? What's the rate of claims on insurance that people buy? So the, the number of house fires reported, you know, as actual fires damaging your property in the U.S. is 0.4 percent of the number of housing units. That's one house fire per house every 250 years. By far the most likely number of house fires you will experience in your life is zero. No guarantee, but that's the most likely number. No one, to my knowledge, has heard me say that and cancel their fire insurance. All right, so events with a probability in the tenths of a percent per year motivate people to spend real money. You could have had a great time spending that insurance premium on something else, and it would have worked in almost every year. Uh, the probability that you will die. Let's just go right to the heart of insurance here. Uh, how likely are you to die? Um, until you reach age 61, the all-causes mortality in the United States is under 1%. Most life insurance is bought by people, young parents. If you're under 40, the probability that you will die next year is under 0.2%. Right? So um, what's the chance, if you have kids, that your life insurance will be needed? Uh, this is not quite as universal as fire insurance, but there's I believe a majority of young parents have life insurance, again, insuring against events that have probabilities in the tenths of a percent per year, almost always not needed. So now let's think back about how likely is the Greenland ice sheet to melt. We've established that it's not the most likely thing to happen this century, but if you say the question really is, is it more or less likely than the things that people buy insurance against? you come up with a very different calculation. I think I haven't really formally tried this, but I believe that if you ask the scientists who are looking at this, does the probability of a catastrophic loss of the Greenland ice sheet reach the level of tenths of a percent probability per year, the kind of probabilities that we buy insurance against, people would say absolutely yes, raising the question of should we buy insurance for the planet. Um, th this is an interesting technical point, and I'm going to delve into more mathematics than is in the book. There is a nice, chatty, verbal version of this in the book, but just for people who were afraid that they couldn't tell it was an economics lecture because it had cartoons and no equations. The next two slides are for you. The rest of you sit tight. English language narration resumes soon. Um, OK, uh, imagine that we had a damage function. This is a work of Martin Weitzman, uh, who has done very interesting work on the, the very theoretical treatment of catastrophic risk, looking both at financial markets and now increasingly at, uh, at climate change. Assume that you have a damage function, I represent D with a parameter X there, which is the climate sensitivity parameter. Climate sensitivity means how many degrees of warming do we get per doubling of atmospheric CO2. Uh, unless we take action very quickly, we are essentially committed to seeing a doubling of CO2 that w well within this century. So on one hand, you could say, we're going to find out. 
Uh, we know that the world is warming, but we don't know how fast. And waiting to find out could easily be too late. So we have to deal with the uncertainty now of, you know, damage increases with the climate sensitivity parameter. That's how hot does it get for a given amount of CO2. Uh, and so the expected value of the damage this is just a weighted, we're taking a weighted average over all the possibilities, which is, you know, that little integral that's there in red, or is that, yeah, orange, uh, the expected value of damage, the damage times the probability over the whole range of possibilities, and assume that you had an exponential damage function, uh, as Weitzman does. Um, if you had a normal distribution of probabilities, you would get a nice, you know, the mathematics would work out such that you'd get a nice definite value. I mean, prob probably if you know what that means, I don't have to explain it. And if you don't know, we'll, we'll just keep moving. Uh, but uh, it, if, you, if you knew that you had a normal distribution, you would, the expected value of the damages would be, under these conditions, a well-defined finite number. Because the, uh, essentially, the uh, probability goes towards zero faster than the damages rise as you start to look at extremes. On the other hand, in a changing complex system, you have limited information about uh, what x is. You're estimating the probability of x from a small sample. You have what your statistics teacher probably called a student's t distribution, which doesn't go to zero nearly as fast. And so put that into the expected value, and the formula blows up. The integral is turns out to be infinite. So what? Look, the, look that conclusion in the face, what you conclude is that in a changing complex system with unbounded risks, the expected value of, of loss, of harm, is infinite. Right? That's, that's what Weitzman called the dismal theorem about this, yeah, unbounded risk and limited information about the risk. You're actually looking at an infinite expected value. Here's more or less the same idea in graphs, uh, why it's sometimes called fat tail uncertainty. Those are the two probability distributions. Blue is the normal curve. That's the bell curve that everyone is familiar with, hopefully. The, the red is the student's t, which you have with less information. So the blue curve applies when you know a whole lot about an uncertainty. You can have that probability distribution of outcomes. The red curve is what you get when you are inferring uncertainty from a very small number of outcomes, a small amount of experiments. And the extreme values, the ex probabilities of an extreme of, you know, being all the way out here is much greater with the red curve. You see there, look at the end of the curve. The red curve is higher out in the tail. So it's the fat-tailed probability distribution, which is what you get from estimating from a very limited amount of information. The average effect where the peak of the curve is is much less important than what's happening out in the tail of the worst probabilities. That's the insurance idea. That's because what's the worst case probability look like? So uh, again, if you knew what this all meant, you probably have run into the idea of Bayesian probability. In the real world, we are all engaged in Bayesian estimation. Uh, estimating unknown distributions from limited evidence. Unless there are external constraints that limit the risk, then the expected value of harm is infinite. The average doesn't matter. Nothing matters as much as understanding and controlling the worst case risks. That's just a fancy mathematical way of saying the same thing I said about insurance. If you think that's mathematic, too mathematical, don't try to read the original. That's a really simple version of what Weitzman did. OK, all done with equations. Um, that was the second idea. The third idea, I, I tried to make these provocative enough that if they were on the bumper stickers in some world of climate policy, people would stop and think about them. Climate damages are often too valuable to have prices. So what happens when we set out to value life and nature? Cost-benefit analysis sounds like such a reasonable procedure. It sounds logical to add up the costs, add up the benefits, and compare them and adopt a policy if the benefits are greater than the costs. With climate change, as with many things, the costs are often well-defined. Well, we'll come to some questions about the costs in just a minute. The costs are hardware. The costs are technologies, programs, measures that reduce emissions, measures that introduce new forms of energy. What does it cost to build windmills and so on? The benefits are protecting human life, protecting nature, protecting the natural services that we enjoy from nature. And if you can't put a value on those, 
you can't actually do a cost-benefit analysis. So let's just go right to the top. What's it worth to save a life? You can't get the right answer to cost-benefit analysis of any environmental policy without knowing what a life is worth, because a whole lot of environmental policies are motivated by the desire to save human lives. So there's a lot of wrong ways to value a human life, and they've been tried. Uh, the first one's the old one, the lost earnings. That occurs to a lot of people. Uh, it's used to figure out compensation for individuals in wrongful death cases. But as a matter of public policy, do we actually want to do that? It has the problem which uh, it was used back in the days of the Pinto case, Ford Pinto, one of the best-selling cars in the 70s until it was discovered that it had the unfortunate exploding gas tank feature and that it was, uh, you know, would have cost about 45 or $50 in today's dollars per car to avoid that. And they did a calculation valuing the lives lost about was it worth it uh, and got the wrong answer. Um, because, I mean, two years later, the Pinto was off the market. Um, so if you value lives by lost earnings, you have the problem of what's an old black woman worth, right? No future earnings. So I, nobody wants to go there, right? That, this just leads to painful discussions that are uh, unacceptable. Uh, so let's try, supposing we did surveys of what are small hypothetical risks worth to you. That's what the Bush administration thought, the EPA and the Bush era thought you should survey people about what would they pay for a small change in risk to life. Uh, do questionnaires that a few people answer in a computer center on a Saturday morning about unrealistic scenarios actually convey how society thinks about human life. Uh, and there's the other method which the Clinton administration EPA used, uh, the wage risk studies. Look at what's the wage differential between more and less risky jobs uh, and say, you know, if going out on the fishing boat as opposed to cleaning the fish on the dock, uh, you know, they're very similar skill levels, but perhaps, but much more risk of death if you go out on the fishing boat. What's the wage premium that gets somebody to go out on the boat? Uh, let's pretend that that expresses society's valuation of life. If the workers in dangerous jobs are exactly typical of all of us, are making an unconstrained decision about what job to take, and are perfectly informed about the wages, then, then maybe otherwise not. It didn't work. There is no meaningful value of a life in monetary terms, and yet there is no meaningful cost-benefit analysis of environmental policy without some such value. It's not only human life. How much is nature worth? Uh, there's the uses that you make of nature. The direct use of nature often has a value, but the existence of nature has a bigger value, which is not well-defined. The value, the use of whales, for instance, is largely constrained to whale watching trips these days in most of the world. The existence of whales is worth, according to surveys, hundreds of times the revenues of whale watching boats. Um, can surveys determine the value of nature? This leads to a whole other set of paradoxes. Are pandas worth more than beetles? They look cuter. Uh, is nature worth more when it's located in a rich country? Really, the best advice to an endangered species is to move to an OECD country because then surveys of people in the area will lead to a larger monetary valuation of the species. Um, all of these valuations seem to depend on the incomes of the people you ask, suggesting that life and nature in rich countries are worth more. Again, not a conclusion that most people want to look in the face. So Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher of 200 and some years ago talked about uh, price and dignity. Uh, you know, long before any of this market economics existed, he, I think, encapsulated this distinction I'm trying to make in a very nice turn of phrase. Some things, he said, have a relative worth or a price. Some things have an intrinsic worth or a dignity. And so we could say cost-benefit analysis fails by putting a price on the dignity of human life in the natural world. That's, that was idea number three. Number four, some costs are better than others. So the costs, costs are easier to deal with than benefits, but they're not problem free in terms of the economics. Um, economic models that tell us what's the ideal policy, the kind that I referred to at the beginning, <coughs> include some theory about 
costs and benefits, and they are comparing costs and benefits. So aside from putting funny dollar values on life and nature or just fudging that problem and you know, lowballing the estimate of benefits, which I think is what often happens, they also have the potential to misunderstand the costs of doing something about it. This is where the can we afford the future, what, would, what are we going to have to spend to do something about this, how do we think about those costs. There are at least two things that we mean by costs. Uh, there are pure physical damages. Property lost to storms is a good example. And then there are the costs of spending money on something different than what we were previously planning to spend money on. Right? It, it's money that was going to be spent going to the mall one more time, eating out one more time, is instead going to be spent on taxes that build windmills something like that. Uh, companies that were previously going to make big cars are now going to make small cars, we hope. Uh, that sort of thing. So these are extremely different concepts of cost. Here, here's a picture of the first kind. These are, of course, pictures of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Pure destruction, uh, loss of quite a bit of human life and community and other things that are impossible to value in monetary terms, as I suggested, but also loss of a whole lot of property that does have a price tag, no redeeming features whatsoever. And here from the same cartoonist is a nice picture of the other kind of cost, the auto industry complaining about the onerous burden of being forced to drive up the, the great mountain of proposed fuel efficiency standards for new cars, which are almost but not quite as strict as the ones now in effect in China. Um, you know, there's been a whole lot of belly aching from the auto industry about being forced to make things slightly different than what they were previously planning to make, things that people seem to want to buy. They often say things like Toyota or Honda on the front aren't really completely different from what General Motors and Chrysler wanted to make, and yet it's a cost to them to be forced to make things that, that people actually want. Um, there's another question about the costs. Are there things you can do for free? Th this is a, a question that always comes up in the economic analysis of energy policy, of climate policy. The McKinsey Company, it's a management consulting company, has been doing these cost curves for marginal abatement costs. What does it cost to reduce another ton of carbon emissions? And, this is their world curve from the first one of their studies. They've now done them for the US and many other countries. And this is the line of zero cost. These are things which they suggest you could do at negative cost. Invest in them and you make money on them. Uh, fuel efficiency in commercial vehicles, lighting systems, getting small businesses to put in energy efficient lights, sometimes pays for itself in a year, uh, sometimes two years. Things that pay for themselves many times over in the life of the equipment. So, you know, they conclude that you get, you know, a fourth or a fifth of the way to the target at negative cost. Is that possible? You know, that here you have the economic theory question, you know, are there any $20 bills on the sidewalk? Uh, there couldn't be because somebody must have picked them up. Nobody picked these up. And this is a consistent finding of bottom-up studies that the world is not full of people who are rationally maximizing all the time and thinking, thinking, thinking about can they save a little money on their energy bills. People can be forced to save money on their energy bills. There's a different kind of question about regulatory coercion. Oh my God, the federal government is so intrusive, they're making me save money. Mm -hmm. um, but you know that, that seems to me what these kind of things suggest to us is that there are investments that people can be forced to make, forcing them to save money. Now, an economic theory that says that everybody already has done everything that would save the money says that this couldn't exist, so the cost must be much higher. Every bottom-up engineering study that looks at how energy is used in the world says that there are these opportunities. Uh, someone I know who studies this says that as fast as we keep taking up these, some of these opportunities, the progress of technology makes more of them, so that this existence of a significant negative cost opportunity to reduce has been uh, historically constant for quite a while. So which category of costs are better? You know, let's think about the cost of prevention versus the cost of destruction. Dutch seawalls are twice as high as the New Orleans levees. They have the added bonus feature of actually working during storms, and uh, the, the cost, as near as I could do in a back of the envelope estimate, was something like 10% of the property lost, never mind the lives lost, but the property lost in 
New Orleans. But suppose that they had even cost the same amount. Suppose that you were faced with spending the same number of dollars on building Dutch seawalls in New Orleans instead of losing that same amount of property to hurricanes. Um, well, right off, it seems to me you, you see that building the levees creates jobs. Uh, letting storms destroy property does not, unless, as some people have objected to this, uh, unless you're sure that you're going to rebuild. If you're sure you're going to rebuild, then you, you know, create the jobs afterwards instead of before. Uh, the experience of New Orleans certainly suggests that you would not be wise to count on 100% rebuilding. Doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, looking more broadly, the whole question of being forced to spend money on renewable energy, conservation, technologies. Uh, if we were at that perfect position where everybody knew everything they could save money on, everybody was perfectly well informed about what they're buying, everybody was fully employed, then forcing people to spend money on anything different would be a cost. If, in fact, we live in the real world where there's a lot of unemployment, a lot of people are not well informed about that, who among us really knows whether they could have saved money by buying a different refrigerator or microwave? I mean, uh, I'm an economist who likes these sort of numbers. I can't stand reading those little tags. Um, it's not only that, but in the longer run, in an imperfect world, uh, you have new jobs created, new industries created, and new technologies take off as a result of government initiatives. You start down a path of technological innovation, which you can't necessarily foresee at the beginning. I'm not going to talk about it here because we're running out of time, but in the book I talk about the, the extent to which the federal government invented microelectronics in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, basically based on, you know, cost is no object spending on the Cold War and, you know, accidentally along the way they invented microelectronics, which after only 20 or 30 years of massive government subsidies was ready to be a private market success story. So I, I take that as a, an interesting model for the new technologies that we need to create for a sustainable energy future, that which of them, wind energy is something like the same story, which of the new technologies would, if given that same kind of treatment, become the Silicon Valley of the next generation. And you have the final question, is this actually a cost? So <clears throat> this is the end of the story, just to recapitulate the four points that are needed for a new climate economics. The future matters. Your granddaughter's life is actually important, and that's why you have to have a discount rate in the 1.5% range, something like what the Stern Review used. Future benefits actually are worth spending money on today, as long as you view the future that way. Uncertainty is decisive. Climate policy is primarily insurance, collective insurance against low probability but not impossible catastrophic events. The average doesn't matter. That was the point of all that math and the stories about insurance. Human lives and nature are priceless. They have a dignity, not a price. Uh, Cost-benefit analysis without them is incomplete. Cost-benefit analysis with numbers attached to them is meaningless. And some costs are well worth paying. The costs of being forced to invent new industries, new technologies, new jobs that will put us onto a different path of economic development that will actually be compatible with a real life for your grandchildren in a world that works for us is entirely preferable to losing property and lives to a violent climate. And if you like the movie, you'll love the book. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. We'll uh, take some questions and answers, but there's some folks on the, on the side here. Uh, we'd like you to speak into the microphone. Not necessarily for us to all hear each other, but, uh, but this is being recorded so folks can look at it on the web. Sure. I'll start. I'm Mikael Munoz from the Paris Center. I have two questions for you. Um, the first one is you're very good at pointing out what's wrong with the conventional economic analysis, intergenerational discount yes. and long term and high risk. But uh, for those of us who are already convinced that all these things are wrong, what my question is what can be salvaged from the current economic analysis? So if I'm designing policy and I look at all these economic studies that say, it's only worth to abate a 1.5%, and I'm like, this is nonsense. Which part of that analysis is worth keeping? Okay. And my second question is, what's the answer to the title of your book? Your answer. Uh, well, my, 
My answer to the second, to the title of the question is, of course we can. It's a mistake to think that there is something else that we are saving money for other than making the world livable for our descendants. That's what people save money for. I mean, just, you know, where, where else were you going to spend it? And uh, to the first question, a tremendous amount of the calculations that go into a conventional analysis are useful. I think that the, the calculation of an optimum, the assigning monetary values to things that don't have monetary values, that, you know, there's a lot of theoretical apparatus well beyond what I've talked about here that just doesn't make sense. Think about the way that most of the world talks about climate policy. Most of the world says there are physical limits that we can't afford to exceed, right? The people who take the science seriously say 450 parts per million or whatever it is. Some people now say 350, 2 degrees or 3 degrees of warming is an absolute limit. So you could take that seriously. You could say that's an absolute not to exceed constraint. And now let's figure out the cheapest way of staying within that constraint so that you then have a cost effectiveness analysis in which all the things you know about the costs of this technology and that technology for energy production, for energy efficiency and so on, all become very interesting. But uh, you say the policy decision has been made. It's not up to economists to second guess was the two degrees or three degrees or 450 target right. It's, you know, it's actually quite a challenging, interesting job to say what is the most cost effective strategy for getting there. I'm actually, in some other work I'm doing, exploring the idea of could we treat development economics the same way? Could we combine climate and development, which is the other big topic I haven't gotten at here, take some target like saying it's unacceptable for a world this rich to have people below X dollars per capita, uh, that in a few decades every region of the world has to be up to X dollars per capita. We take that as an absolute constraint and the climate limits as a constraint and say, what's the least cost way of meeting both at once? It's a, so it does actually use a lot of the pieces, but I think accepting the fact that public policy is the driver, not some funny economic theory. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your talk. And I'm just curious, um, it's difficult, you know, to value some of these things like human lives, ecosystem services, but on the other hand, if we don't try to assign some value to ecosystem services, how do we work with that, you know, from uh, trying to mitigate climate changes? Well, you learn some things from valuing ecosystem services, but not others. You know, what's the value of whales in terms of ecosystem services? They make it possible for all those whale watching boats to run around the harbor. Uh, you know, the value of the existence of whales to people is not actually captured by any ecosystem service they deliver. So I, I think that the, there is a, the ecological economics discussion of ecosystem services has been very interesting and has enriched our understanding, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't capture everything. It bites off one more piece of the world that has a dignity and not a price, uh, which stretches on beyond that. So I, I think you still have to look at, even with a nice set of ecosystem service valuations, you've still got an incomplete picture of what life and nature is worth. Would it be fair to say that you still need the some uh, approximation, some estimation of the services, but not necessarily? You need to have that as part of a larger vision of what it's worth. Well, I think that when you can do those and produce meaningful numbers, that's great. I think there are some people who have tried to, you know, go way beyond what the data supports and calculate the value of everything. You end up with silly numbers. You end up debating, are they silly? Um, I, you look at the value, the question of the value of a human life, which is to me the most important of the priceless values. What's the ecosystem services valuation of a human life? You know, we're, we are definitely, the, the discussion of the valuation of ecosystem services has taken us a good ways along and we need to go much farther than it can possibly go. I had a chance to do this talk in a meeting with Herman Daly in it, and he actually loved that line. He was completely in agreement with that. It was another. Thank you. Pablo Suarez from the Party Center as well. Um, I think you made very good use of cartoons, and even you. your book's cover has the cartoonist aesthetics. Uh, cartoons have a great way to reach us and our understanding and make a 
make us get the aha moment. This Something. cartoon was done by the publisher. I asked them why was the title a thought that was occurring to Finland, and <laughs> as near as I could see on their map, but they never I had it was an answer. The Stockholm yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, but in any case, clearly this is a more successful way of communication than, say, the equations, which provide, I would argue, irrefutable evidence of how some things are wrong or some things are necessary. What I'm noticing is that as a scholarly community, as a, a, mm -hmm. a bunch of people who like uh, using brains, we're not researching enough how to communicate stuff mm -hmm. so that the general public and the decision makers, you know, Copenhagen and so on, make decisions that we think would be better informed. Yep. Could you give us a sense of what directions of research or action the academic environment could use to, to be more effective at communicating? because we have all the equations in the planet and all the demonstrations yeah. in the planet, but it doesn't seem to be working fast enough. Uh, I mean, nobody knows fully how to do this fast enough. This is my attempt. I actually started my career after graduate school working as a journalist for a while before going to economic research. And, um, I, you know, I, I think that the challenge of telling a complicated story in simple language is is a big challenge. I, I mean, um, there's some physicist who said you had to be able, if you're going to do physics all day, you had to figure out how to go into a bar at night and tell somebody what you'd done all day. Um, I, you know, it's a challenge, you know, what what is the point of this if you can't explain it in simple languages? This is my attempt, you know, the, uh, this is an attempt to write a half-length book, you know? The publisher uh, thought that people don't want to read full-length books, so, um, you know, hundred and some pages, uh, trying to boil the story down into simple languages. I, the book doesn't have the equations, but in giving this talk to sometimes critical audiences, I ended up feeling like I need to put them in to show that, yes, I am conversant with that world, and yes, there actually is a technical story behind this, as well as the insurance stories convey that technical point much better. Uh, and I actually in the chapter of the book about that where I'm talking about those ideas with none of the equations I have a little story about you know the the climate change card game what if uh, each year's climate is like drawing a card from a deck and then what if we discover that the dealer is changing the deck and how do we discover how fast the dealer is changing the deck which is you know a metaphor which I worked on quite a bit to figure out how to convey this incredibly complicated idea uh, Marty Weitzman was just blown away at the idea that anybody could explain his mathematics in such simple terms. So it, it's, you're right, it's the constant struggle. Thanks. So, uh, great talk. What, what, you're, uh, what it seems like you're saying is that you're, you're asking us to treat uh, global climate change as a security issue. Rather than asking what it costs, you want us to ask what it takes. And so if we move to what it takes and we turn this into a security issue, then there's a whole menu of those things that we're being asked to, uh, to look at as well, right? Some people say we need to do anything we can at the least or all costs to save the banking system or to eradicate HIV AIDS in sub-Saharan Africa mm -hmm. and South Asia um, or to get rid of terrorism or, or so forth. How, how, how are we supposed to uh, make trade-offs as public policymakers across these security issues? Or can we afford all of them? It's, um, that question comes up a lot. Uh, it's, it's certainly a good question. I mean, the question of what does this cost? Uh, Nicholas Stern's latest estimate is that 10% um, of the, what the world is now spending on defense you know, if you took everybody's military budgets worldwide, 10% of that is what we need to spend on climate change. So it's a noticeable amount of money, but uh, it's, it's, you know, as he says, there's no way to suggest it's unaffordable. It's 10% uh, of the military budget for many countries, 1% of the total government revenue. Um, that's a cost, you know, the sort of securing the future must be worth that. and. It doesn't seem like rich countries are unable to do two or three things of that size at once. Uh, you know, they, there's no sense that it has crowded out everything else that's possible. There's a, a kind of a whining entitlement uh, debate in Congress. I've testified a few times in Congress about the costs of climate change, and 
uh, you know, that you would, the Republicans you would think represented districts full of starving people who you were pushing over a cliff by asking them to contemplate a carbon tax that might raise the price of gasoline a little bit. Um, you know, nothing, it would, nobody's policies will raise the price of gasoline nearly as much as last summer's oil price spike did. I mean, that, that is not in anybody's vision of it. But I, I think that getting over the notion that we are somehow at the brink of we can't afford anything. There are tremendous issues of equity, which have been made worse, about who pays for it. And do people assume that, of course, things work out to make the people who have the least pay the most? I mean, that's a very unfortunate part of our political culture. But the notion that America, Europe, Japan, et cetera, can't pay the kind of costs that it would take to solve the climate problem, um, it's again, you know, what are you saving the money for if you can't contemplate you know, 1% level expenditures to save the future. What is it that you're going to do with it in this generation that's worth risking future generations for? Uh, back to the title. Just doesn't make any sense to me. The other thing which I meant to say about that is that in looking at when there was a big push to spend money on HIV, AIDS, the prevention first came out and it was at a time of growing breast cancer awareness. Uh, there was a lot of push and there was a big debate about were those two priorities crowding out other medical spending. It appeared to me that funding for other medical research went up, not down, at the time when there was the most public pressure to spend money on AIDS and breast cancer. Um, so I, I think that the, the crowding out hypothesis is wrong more often than we think. We'll make this the last question. Oh, I can stick around. What's that? We can do a couple more if people have more. My name is Rick Balestri. I'm an IR graduate student here at BU. Um, with respect to the current constraints in the U.S. political environment, given the existence of the lobbyists, um, term limits, election cycles, and such, what pragmatic advice would you give to policymakers with specific uh, focus on U.S. transportation sector and U.S. Uh, electricity generation? Something that, you know, in the near term, here in the mm -hmm. next two, four, two to four years, we could actually make some headway on. There's, um, there's a lot of things that can be done both about electricity and transportation. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to generate electricity and how fast we move away from using coal is the big question. And secondarily, how much do we develop and spread the technologies that will help the rest of the world move away from coal? Some of the fast growing developing countries, of course, China and India, have a lot of coal and limited other energy resources. So inventing alternatives and promulgating the alternatives to coal, making wind power work, even natural gas has you know, something like half the emissions per kilowatt hour. Uh, so as good as a stopgap on the way to reducing. Uh, there are many, many ways to save electricity, to reduce the demand for electricity, the efficiency measures. There are many ways at different stages of commercialization for producing electricity with lower carbon. Transportation is more difficult. Once people have spread themselves out as much as Americans have, uh, we're almost committed to uh, individual transportation, uh, certainly high density, urban corridors and mass transit are the most efficient way to move people and inventing livable communities around that is a long-term project, not in a few years. Even within the cars that are on the road, there's an enormous range. And, you know, what if, what if people had to buy more fuel-efficient cars? What if, what if our fuel efficiency standards were better than China's rather than weaker? You know, uh, it, it's... Um, you know, it's a surprising process and it's not always, it's not strictly related to size as much as you think it is. I actually went out to buy a fuel efficient car last year and was amazed to discover that the Prius, which is moderately roomy, gets better mileage than a number of smaller cars. Um, so, you know, there may be surprises along the way to figuring out what it is that uh, you could buy a much smaller car, which was going to be worse for the environment as well as feeling more cramped. So that it's, a, it's a subtler question than you think it is in terms of uh, what, what will that mean. But I, I think you know, the failure to push ahead on moving away from coal, the failure to push ahead on you know, the things we can do immediately on transportation. What I've ended up talking about in Washington is the cost of inaction. I, I've done research projects about trying to estimate 
a few of, you know, there's no, as I said, there's no way to estimate the complete costs that climate change will involve in lost lives and lost ecosystems. But for a few pieces of it that you can put dollar values on, you can quickly come up with estimates that are larger than the costs of action that people are talking about. So that I've, uh, I've ended up testifying uh, to several House committees about the, even a very partial listing of the costs of inaction on climate change will, within this century, dwarf the costs that are now being asked in terms of policy. Okay, thank you very much, Frank. Okay, thank you.